Take your Bible and open up with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 22, and put a marker here. This is just uh, where we get started tonight, then we will move beyond here. Matthew chapter 22, this uh, past week, an excellent observation uh, or a question was given concerning this series, and I'd like to address it just kind of a bit ahead of schedule uh, because it really does kind of set up the message for tonight. As I opened the series, I asked, what is the greatest question that has ever been asked? And the greatest question was followed by the greatest answer. The individual had said that when I introduced this, you know, they thought the greatest question is going to be, are you saved? And you know, if we are talking to somebody and we have the opportunity to ask them questions about what's going on in their life and things about their life, we want to get to that question because that is of utmost importance to find out, have they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior? But that is not what I've presented yet in this message series. Instead, take a look here in Matthew chapter 22, where we've been. Verse 34, the Bible says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. And then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second, like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Here's the warm-up message. Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with everything that you got. Therefore, the greatest question was, which is the greatest commandment? When you look at the question, the question was not asked from sinful man to sinful man. So what I mean by that is if we think about what is the question that I should ask somebody else? Where am I wanting to get to with that question? Are you saved? That is sinful man talking to sinful man. But this question is being asked from sinful man to the God man, the one who is 100% God, 100% man. So it's being asked on a totally different plane, a different level. Jesus said there are two commands, love God, love others. And upon those four words hangs all of the law and the prophets. And you say, well, why wouldn't Jesus have said anything about salvation? And the answer is, he did. He really did. This was a lawyer. This was a Pharisee who was asking the question. Remember that the lawyers in the, the, of the Pharisees, it wasn't that they were talking about the laws of the land kind of a thing, but they were wanting to debate and they were wanting to argue the laws of God. They were wanting to know, what is the greatest of your laws, God? So God responds back, Jesus Christ responds back to him by answering the question that he asked. He gave him law. He took him to the book of Exodus, something that this Pharisee lawyer would have known. He takes him right back to the top one of the law. What is the purpose of the law? Why would Jesus have done that? Why would you take somebody to the law? What's the purpose? Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, remember the Pharisees, they were quite conceited, they were quite full of themselves, they thought if anybody was going to heaven for sure, it's got to be them, because they are the Pharisees. And here's a lawyer of the Pharisees, I mean, he ought to make it, right? Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, the Bible says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Remember that the Pharisee was not looking for answers. They were looking to trip Jesus up. They were trying to get him in a trap so that if he answered the wrong way, they could say, aha, we got you. You're not who you say you are. And so when the Pharisee asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, I'll give you the greatest commandment. Love God. Love God with your everything. It is the first of the law. What's the purpose of the law? To bring a person to Christ. Why do you need the law? Because the law convicts you it demonstrates not that you became a sinner, but that you are a sinner. You do not become a sinner when you find out, oh, I guess I broke that law. Okay, I guess now I'm a sinner. No, we come into this world as a sinner. We are conceived in sin, and the law simply proves that truth. So Jesus takes him to the law because this Pharisee has not accepted yet 
that he's a sinner. Go back to Matthew 22. Back to Matthew 22. Jesus is going to take this further with him. Starting in verse 41. In verse 41, Jesus says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, it's Jesus' turn to ask a question. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. That question shut them down. And they couldn't ask anything else because he had them. They, had, they were confronted with not only the fact of the gospel message, the law that is taking them to Christ and demonstrating that they are the chiefest of sinners, but they had not even acknowledged who Jesus Christ is. Think about it this way. Can a person really love God, and I mean agape love God, without accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior? Is that possible? It is not possible. You are right. Why? Because the agape love has to be shed abroad in our hearts. So we first have to trust we love him because he first loved us. So we are in response to his love, accepting Jesus as Savior. He puts his agape love into us, thereby we are now able to agape love him. But think of this farther. Can a person love God if they don't believe that Jesus is God? And that's exactly where the lawyer was at. He doesn't even believe that Jesus is God, much less getting hung up on the very first of all the commandments. Therefore, the greatest answer was an introduction to the gospel, and these Pharisees just weren't ready to receive it. The law was given to bring about conviction in this lawyer and the Pharisees. I don't know about you, but when I think about how the Lord laid this out, it is not only interesting, but it's exciting. God's good, isn't he? And I mean, when, when the Pharisees and everything, when they were asking questions, they got their heads together. Oh, how can we trip him up? Let's try this. Let's try that. You know, if, how many, if she's married seven times, who are you going to be married to in heaven? All this kind of, oh, we got a good question. And they always had something different until Jesus says, now let me ask you a question. And he just shuts them right down. And from that point on, they've got nothing else to say. The lawyer was out lawyered. That is fantastic. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing, but they were presented with the law so that it would turn them to Christ because it demonstrated where their heart was at. Turn with me in your Bible now back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, when Jesus said this to this lawyer, the answer to that question, what is the greatest commandment? Someone who is well-versed in the law of God and of Moses this lawyer should have immediately recognized what Jesus was telling him was directly out of the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Huh. That lawyer should have perked up, and he should have recognized this. You know, what you say, well, they can't memorize the entire Old Testament. This isn't memorizing the entire Old Testament. What you have here in Judaism is called the Great Shema. The Shema was, it means to put yourself under that which you have heard. The very first words in the Hebrew, hear, O Israel. The word hear is the Hebrew word Shema. And they called this the Great Shema. The lawyer knew this. He knew that the answer to the question as soon as he asked it. But for some reason, the way Jesus put this to him, I think it pricked him right straight to his heart. and He wasn't able to answer the question because he knew that he didn't love the Lord with all of his heart and mind and soul and strength and body and everything he's got. Tonight, the message title is The Description of the Love of God. How do we know if we love the Lord with our all? From the introduction, this must begin with us knowing Jesus Christ is our Savior. That's where it has to start. And so that is the given. Once we have achieved that given, we know Christ is our Savior, how do we know if we are really loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and everything that we got the way that we're supposed to? 
The first thing is this. It's going to take us a couple of weeks to get through this. The first thing is a growing understanding of who God is. A growing understanding of who God is. Again, in those verses, the Lord our God is one Lord. You know, all of us have our pet interests and topics when it comes to studying the Bible. There are some that just really love prophecy. Man, they will pour through the Revelation. They'll pour through the uh, book of Daniel and Jeremiah and, and some of the other major and the minor prophets, just digging out all these truths about prophecy. There are some that just can't seem to get out of the Psalms. The Psalms are wonderful. They're comforting. They are soothing. They're easier to understand, probably, out of all the different things that you see in the Old Testament. Uh, they tend to hit you right where you live. Some really get into studying about sin and worldly influence and uh, the ways that sin creeps into our lives. Others like topics like marriage and communication and relationships and counseling people through their problems. Maybe you have something different that you like to study. But do you realize that when we get hung up studying on our pet interest and topics, that it also has drawbacks? For instance, the individual that is so wrapped up into prophecy how many of those individuals begin to see uh, prophecy that isn't there? You know, they, and that's how they get books published. And then people get on, oh, here's something else. Great. Oh, wow, I never saw that. And start connecting. Just like the blood moons nonsense that was out for a while. And boy, oh boy, people just really latched on to the blood moons. And people that ought to know better latched on to the blood moons. And just kind of sit there, oh, it's, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah, here we are, right? So that can be a detrimental turnoff, if you will. The Psalms, they're wonderful, but there's 65 other books of the Bible, and they've got meat and potatoes that we need. Those focused on sin have a tendency to become, uh, they almost develop an insensitivity to their own sin. And it becomes so much easier to see everybody else's sin, and then to become nitpickers. And nitpickers are the individuals that uh, everybody's wrong, I'm right, I'm, you know, that kind of mentality. And that's a danger. Those focused on the other topics, they're definitely good and they're helpful things to, to be able to help others. But again, it gives us tunnel vision. When was the last time that we were consumed with studying our Bibles to learn more about who God is? To learn more about His attributes? To understand more about uh, what it means about his character of being righteous and holy and just and mercy and all these kinds of things. When was the last time that we really poured ourselves in to gleaning out of God's word as much as we possibly could to understand who God is? Let's trace something here. Go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 3. I think it's very possible that we have fallen into the exact same trap that the children of Israel fell into. In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, we have the passage where uh, we have the bush that was burning but was not consumed, and God commissions Moses. And it says in verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Does that strike anybody odd? that they would want to know, well, who, who are you talking about? What's his name? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, thou shalt, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. Why did they need that name? There's a lot of times we have studied before about what that name means, I am that I am. But I want us to think about it this way. The children of Israel have been in the Egyptian captivity for 430 years. Exodus chapter 12 verse 41 tells us they were there for 430 years. 30 years. They were being held in captivity and they were exposed to the religion of Egypt and their gods. The pagan culture, I believe, began to wear them down. The more that they were around that pagan culture, it has dulled their spiritual senses and they're not able to adequately identify who God is because they've got all these other things that are going on in their world. 
Though we are here in America surrounded by an abundance of churches, we are in a very pagan land. This is a very pagan land. And while our gods are not some sort of a statue maybe that like they would have been back here in Egypt and and Babylon would have had them and all the other heathen nations, maybe our gods aren't in the form of a statue. But we have the gods of materialism. We have the gods of hedonism. We have the gods of materialism, capitalism. We've got all the isms. And all of our isms are a schism. And they are exactly that. They are a god. And they have taken the place of of what it means to know the one and true God. We've got so many things in life that distract us. So many things in life that will keep us from doing the things of the Lord. So many things that consume our time. That if somebody says, hey, could you do this? Could you do Oh, I don't have time to do that. Talking about doing something that would be actively serving the Lord. Oh, I don't have time to do that. Why? Because we are so wrapped up in everything else. And so much else has taken the... uh, precedent in our life. Christians, we need an intense refresher course on the character and the nature of God. Who is he? Go to the book of Exodus chapter 19. As the children of Israel left Egypt and after they crossed the Red Sea, where is the first place that God essentially leads them? In Exodus chapter 19, the Bible says, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt the same day, came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and to tell the children of Israel. You read through, and by the time you get to Exodus chapter 20, what was the message that Moses was to bring down to them? Exodus 20, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They have been so exposed, so surrounded to all sorts of other gods, and God starts out his law with this. They're given the law. As we have seen, the Lord reveals himself, his nature, To the people, he reveals himself as Messiah, and the law is what is going to be the vehicle that he uses to do that. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 5. A lot of times in New Testament churches, which that's exactly what we are, we say, well, the law is no more. We don't have anything to do with the law anymore. Well, notice what the Bible says here. Matthew 5 verse 17, Jesus said this, He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. And the Bible says here in Romans 7, 12, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, and just, and good. One more, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and look with me at verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. But we know that the law is good, if a man use it lawfully. So the Bible tells us the law is good, it is holy, it points us to Christ, The law today, we use it to show an individual the nature, the character of God. We use the law to show them their nature and their character, which is a sinner. And we use the law to take an individual to Christ. That's the purpose of it. You know, we've got to understand the character of God. That's how we know that we are loving him more and more, because as we learn more and more about his character, his nature, we begin to be overwhelmed in the day-to-day life of just who God is. Who is this overshadowing God that controls everything in our life? Who is this God that has the right to be Lord over us? Who is this person? 
Who do people say that I am? What name should we give? I am that I am. What does it mean? Who is that God? Maybe we need to approach our personal Bible study a little bit different. Rather than, uh, and I tell you, as a pastor, pastors as a whole, this is one of our biggest struggles. Because when we sit down to study, you be in your Bible every day, and it's to prepare a sermon. But you got to be in your Bible for yourself and for learning about God. And you say, well, aren't you doing the same? Isn't that the same thing? I will promise you it is not the same thing. It is not the same thing. And Christians, if we get tunnel vision on our topics, our favorite topics, and we just can't hardly stand to think of studying about anything else, oh boy, i got to find more and more and more and more and more about this. We get that tunnel vision, and we miss out on learning about the character and the nature of God. It's got to start there if we are going to increase in our love for Him. Here's the second thing tonight. An increasing knowledge about what God does. Not only do we need to know more about his character and nature, we need to know more about what he does. Go back to Exodus chapter 15. We keep going back to these Old Testament passages because when the question was asked from the Pharisee lawyer to Jesus, it was essentially under the Old Testament economy. And so in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, after the children of Israel have crossed the Red Sea, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And on and on it goes to describe what God has done. Go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 24. O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness, and thy mighty hand for what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. One more, let's go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 1. This is a psalm that Asaph has given. And it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. On and on the passages of Scripture go that encourage us to know what it is that God has done. As you think about what God has done, why would we be afraid to trust Him with what needs to be done? When we have all these examples of things that He's done. Here's, I think, one of the problems that we have in in Christianity and maybe in fundamental Baptist circles, maybe maybe we capitalize on this, I don't know. But we're really good about saying, don't do this and don't do that, and this is what you ought to do and this is what you ought to do. And it's not necessarily wrong. But if you understand it from the standpoint of This is who God is, and this is what God has done. Isn't that a whole lot easier than to say, and so this is what we should do? When you've got that foundation. This is who God is, this is what God has done. How does that apply to modern day life? Well, it's not that hard to figure out. History right now is being rewritten in America. We are watching that happen. Why is history being rewritten? 
They can give you all sorts of reasons why, but I think you can go back to the ultimate reason being the fact of this country being founded upon Christian values and principles, upon the founding fathers stand upon the Word of God, their dependence upon the Word of God, the things that they would say about how the Bible, and I'm talking presidents, I'm talking senators, I'm talking Supreme Court justices, I'm talking people that signed original documents, as they talk about the dependence that we have upon God and the Word of God and relying upon Him. The calls from, from those early presidents and, and, and leaders that would tell this nation to go before God. They named who you're supposed to pray to and what you're supposed to pray for and that we are to humble ourselves before Him. This is not a Christian nation that we are in right now, folks. It is taking us as far away from a Christian nation as we can possibly be. And you say, well, there's nations that are far worse. Well, how did they get there? Just like we're getting there. Should the Lord tarry in the next 50 years, can you imagine what the United States of America is going to look like? I think it is going to look an awful lot like England looks like today, like Ireland looks like today. Those were once places that were full of the gospel preaching churches. But tonight, today, it's just kind of a ghost town where those things are concerned. How did they get there? A little bit at a time. You look at the Bible and you look at the, the missionary maps of where Paul traveled and Silas and, and Barnabas and all the different ones, Titus, Timothy, all the places that they had been, and all those places that were at one time saturated with the gospel and had gospel preaching churches. Now it's literally a, 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 a conservative evangelical ghost town. It just doesn't exist. How does that happen? A little bit at a time. And that's where we're at. We have the woke culture, the pushing of the Project 1619, the revisionist history, the tearing down of statues and monuments, a variety of actions being taken which effectively creates a new truth narrative, and the kids that are in the public school system are being indoctrinated with it. And you know what? They walk away going, oh, well, I didn't know that. How come nobody ever told me that? Because it's not true. That's why you weren't told that. And there's nobody, in, there's nobody counteracting what's being taught. And I'm talking point for point. Oh, yeah, there's people that I know that are, are going the other direction. But if you've got a child that is sitting five days a week under the tutelage of, of a revisionist history, okay, who's sitting down with them the other five days, or not the other five days of the week, but five other times throughout the week, refuting what they have been taught that is revisionist history? Who's doing that? I mean, the average kid comes home from school. Parents, you know what the answer is. What'd you learn today? Exactly. And yet, they did. They came away indoctrinated. They came away indoctrinated with a new truth narrative that isn't truth at all. One of the best things that we can do to encourage and increase our faith is to study the works of God. Because the God who was God then is the God today, and that's the same God tomorrow. And so if he did all these wonderful miracles, and, and I don't know about you, yeah, I think I do. I still believe God works miracles. I really believe he works miracles. Am I talking about parting the Red Sea? How many times did he do that in history? Biblical history, I should say. We got twice, well, not the Red Sea, but parting the waters. We see it twice, okay? Am I expecting to walk out and watch the Maumee River just go, Pfft. <laughs> not really. Does it need to? <laughs> but God still works miracles he still does great things and so we go back and we study what God has done to remind us of what God can still do here's the third thing that has to happen if we are really loving the Lord with all of our heart go with me to John's gospel chapter 14 this is the last one that we're able to tackle tonight. We'll get back to this in a couple of weeks. Uh, John chapter 14 and verse 15. The third thing tonight, there has to be a developing shift of our heart. A developing shift of our heart. Now, I'm talking to people that are saved. 
We have already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. But Christians, is there 100% of Christians, their heart wholly given to the Lord? No, I'm not talking in the salvation sense. I'm talking in in day-to-day living. We need to become that individual that has a shifting heart, that is constantly shifting more and more and more and more towards the Lord. For this reason, verse 15, Jesus said, if ye love me, finish it out. So obedience follows love. That's the whole point that we started on this. Obedience follows love. Are we supposed to obey God's word? Absolutely, 100%. Are we supposed to pick and choose what parts of God's word we obey? No. But what is supposed to be the the well from which obedience springs? It's got to be our love for the Lord. Otherwise, it's just empty moves. Let's prove this. In the life of the saved person, go with me to Revelation chapter 2. A few months ago, we went through the seven churches of the Revelation. Here's a body of believers, the very first church that is addressed. And it says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear with them that are evil, and thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Is that an obedient church? Boy, they are just toeing the line. They, they can tell you what you should do, what you shouldn't do, how you should do it, how you shouldn't do it. They are faithful in all the good works that they are doing, and there is not one thing that is said negative to any of their works. Not one thing. Verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Christians, it is very easy to go through the motions. Very easy to go through the motions. I cannot see anybody's heart. It's none of my business to see anybody's heart. I don't want to see anybody's heart. But I want you to ask yourself a question tonight. Why am I here? On a Wednesday night, when it's damp and rainy, And I got home from work and parked the car in the garage and the engine said, leave me alone. (laughs) I want to cool down. And I could just sit and relax. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm hungry. What made you go out the door, put the key in the car and come out again? Don't answer out loud. This is nobody's business. This is between you and God. What made you come? I'm thankful for every single person that did come. But God knows why you're here. Coming, being a part of the services and everything, would be Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. It would be a good work, if you will. But what made you do it? Was it love for the Lord? Is it because, Lord, I love you so much, I love your people, I want to be where I'm in the middle of that. I want to be in a place where I can join together with other believers in Christ and sing to you and pray to you. You know, if we find that our heart isn't driving us out of love to be obedient, then the Lord has somewhat against us because the love has got to be there first and foremost. And if the love isn't there then all those good works, I mean, it's good, we shouldn't stop doing it, but it's just mechanical. And we think we're going to end up with rewards in eternity for just being mechanically obedient when God says, I want you to be lovingly obedient. I've shared the story before years ago with Dad wanting me to work in the shop on a Saturday, and I wanted to do anything but work in the shop on a Saturday. And I had an attitude. I know that's hard to believe, but I did. I had an attitude. And uh, we were out there, and I was in a grump. I was getting the work done. I was getting it done fast. I was getting it done right. And Dad said something to me, and I I had the audacity to spark off at him, and I says, what? I says, isn't it getting done right? 
And he says, yeah, he says, but your attitude's not right. And I corked off, and I says, well, just be glad it's getting done right. And at that point, Dad should have laid me out. Should have laid me out right there in the yard. And instead, Dad just shook his head, and he says, oh, Johnny. That had more of an impact than if he'd laid me out in the yard. He really did. And I, I, I know my dad, he was probably fighting that down. <laughs> he was probably wanting to knock me back home. But he didn't do that. And I can still, to this day, see the hurt in his face. Because I wasn't out there because I loved him, and because I loved doing what I was doing for him and with him. I was fighting it every step of the way, tooth and nail. Doing it right, perfunctory, perfect work. As good as you can do. But the heart wasn't right. How about a lost person? Let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 7. Mark, chapter 7, verse 5. In Mark, chapter 7, and verse 5, then the Pharisees and scribes asked him. Now, right there it establishes that we're talking to a lot of lost people. Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. This is a lost audience. Did they appear religious? Did they appear very devout? Did they, would they have argued that they were doing this for God? And that God was well pleased with their, uh, just the way they were doing it. Oh, it was so ceremonial and all the pomp and circumstance behind it. I mean, it just looked religious. Was God pleased with it? <laughs> he was not pleased in the least little bit. You see, this is where I think we run into a hard time sometimes. We have people in our lives, they don't know Christ as Savior, but they are some of the most decent, moral, um, kind. I mean, they don't cuss, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't play the law. I mean, they just don't do any of the bad stuff. And they are so religious. I mean, they will talk about reading their Bibles. Oh, they pray all the time and, and, and you know, rub their beads and cross themselves and, and go to classes and go to church and all this kind of stuff. And we say, boy, they, how can they not be in heaven someday? You can do all of those things and miss heaven. And that's, you know, Christians, we're not doing anybody any favors if we give them a pass because they're so religious and they just seem so squeaky clean. In fact, we might look at them and say, well, they're more squeaky clean than brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. How can it be that they're not saved? Look at the Pharisees. I mean, that was a clean bunch. Remember one of the times where Jesus said, except your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. This is a righteous bunch. Self-righteous, but a righteous bunch. Christians, we have got to recognize that religiosity, we can't be blinded by it. We've got to make sure that the end, and, and that'll be the hardest person to witness to, really. I mean, it's just like, Brother Frank and I, what was that, about three years, we went all through the streets of Brian. Did you know all of Brian is saved? Except for one honest atheist? <coughs> Everybody's saved. Everybody's going to church. They can't tell you who their pastor is. They don't know the last time they were there. But they're all saved. Well, would you like to know what the Bible says? No, I'm good, thanks. I didn't know we were in such a religious community. Wow. You wouldn't think we'd have a bar, a tattoo parlor, a, a beer sold at the stores. You wouldn't think we'd have lottery tickets and everything. And this, I mean, this is a squeaky clean town. There's the hardest people to witness to. 
How do we know? How do we know that we are really growing in our love for the Lord as we should? We see these things developing. We start getting really into the nuts and bolts of this. We're applying this to our life now. Christian, can we see these things developing in us? Can you see it developing in somebody else? If you can, encourage somebody tonight. Say, you know, I really do see spiritual growth in you. If we don't see it in ourselves, that tells us what we need to be working on, doesn't it? It tells us what we need to be confessing before the Lord and saying, Lord, this is what I need, and I know that, and I want to love you more than anything else. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, how can you say that you love God when you have rejected His Son? You say, oh, I've not rejected Him. Well, if you have never accepted the fact that you're a sinner and that the only way to be saved is because Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins and shed His blood in full payment of your sins and was buried in the tomb and rose from the grave and that's all there is to the gospel, you don't add something to that. You don't you know, say, well, I believe that and I have to join with the church and, and try to do my best and just kind of hope it all works out. Well, that's not believing the gospel. It's thumbing your nose at what Jesus did and is telling the Father, your son didn't do enough, I have to help him. That's blasphemous. That is absolutely blasphemous. Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, the only life. And if you're here tonight without Jesus Christ as your Savior, I don't care if you're a member of this church, I don't care if you think you've been saved for umpteen years, if you cannot point to that time in your life where you gave your heart and life to Jesus and acknowledged yourself as that sinner that needs His gift of salvation, and you called upon the name of the Lord for salvation, Nothing added to the plan. Nothing subtracted from the plan. This needs to be the night you do that. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this evening. If you're here without Christ as your Savior right now, would you just pray something like this? But it's got to be from your heart. It's got to be you praying us. Lord, I am a sinner. And I know. I know that I'm on my way to an eternity in hell. I may have fooled everybody else, but God, I have not fooled you. I believe tonight that you love me. That you died on a cross for my sins. That you were buried in that tomb and that you arose from the grave. I believe that, Lord. And tonight, I ask you to come into my heart and save me. There is a, no other gospel message than that. I repent tonight, Lord, and believe that gospel message. Have you prayed that tonight? You say, I've never, I've never prayed that before. This is the first time I've ever prayed that, and I meant that. Would you just slip your hand up this evening? And our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to love us. Help us, Lord, to love you more and more each day. As we die to self and Mortify the deeds of the flesh and search your word and, and seek out your nature, your character, the things that you have done, and our heart begins to shift more and more towards you. May we be able to say that we love you more today than we did yesterday, and that that love for you we continue to grow. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.